Amen. Amen. Good morning, Lakeview Church. Good to be with you. Got a question for you this morning. Anybody loves surprises? Surprises. I'm not a surprise man. Like every time I seem to get a surprise, it seems like it turns out to be bad news. Surprise! Happy birthday! Oh, thank you for the surprise heart attack that I wasn't expecting. Really appreciate that. Um, surprises are interesting. Life's full of them. A few years ago, I uh, got a letter in the mail, and it said, uh, hey, you need to fill out this form with all this personal information on it, because we owe you money. <laughs> Right? Well, we kind of live in a world that's pretty scam artist rich, so naturally I was a little bit hesitant about that. But the letter looked like it was pretty official, and it was from the Utah State Tax Commission. I said, well, they have an office downtown. I'm just going to walk in there and carry this letter in and see if it's legitimate. So I went downtown, uh, walked into the Utah State Tax Commission, and sure enough, that was a legitimate request. Um, I sat down with somebody, and they said, yep, is this you? Yep, can you prove it's you? Great. Here's your check. We owe you a little over $300. I said, what in the world is this? And it turns out that years earlier when we sold our first house, there was some kind of a holdover from an escrow account, and it, it was overpayment of some taxes, and it ended up being held by the Utah State Tax Commission. So I got this check for like 300 bucks. It was super cool, right? On the flip side of that, though, this year, a couple months ago, uh, I get a call from my mortgage company, uh, and they said, hey, you know the house you're living in? I said, Yeah. Yeah, listen, when you did your mortgage, we bought this house two years ago this month. They said, when you did your mortgage, um, there was a miscalculation. And uh, we kind of missed it last year. So you're two years deep on not paying enough money into your escrow account. You're over a year and a half behind in your uh, property taxes. And you owe us a bunch of money because we've been paying your homeowner's insurance. So we need you to write us a really uncomfortable check right now. And then, great news, your house payment's going up a couple hundred bucks a month to make sure this doesn't happen again. Oh, swell, thanks. Yay for surprises. Look, both of these are examples of things that came out of nowhere, right? One good, one bad. It's a surprise. It was unexpected, both of them. And the truth is, the best advice I can give to somebody for things like that that are going to happen in life is the old adage, expect the unexpected. It's still good advice. Be ready for the unexpected. Well, welcome back today. We're, we're continuing in our series called The Art of Adulting. And in this message series, we're taking a look at a bunch of different subjects. We're putting our, some of our beliefs and some of the things that, that maybe we've settled on up against God's Word, and we're finding out what makes sense and what doesn't, and we're going to throw out the junk where we find it. The idea here is that we dodge some of the pain and foolishness that comes into our lives by uh, leaning into foolishness instead of wisdom. In fact, our series thesis is this, love atones for sin and foolishness, and wisdom avoids it, right? There's great news there. We're going to fumble, we're going to make mistakes, and Jesus' work on the cross graciously pays for every single one of those. However, uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't avoid as much uh, of the shenanigans of life as possible, right? Now, this may seem like a redundant or unnecessary question for some of you, but think about it. Is there anyone here who feels like they're just running full throttle all the time? 99.9% .9 on the old RPM gauge, right? Never a break, never time to rest, never time to recuperate, never time to settle. Uh, you know, you feel like all your time's handling, spent handling the daily essentials of life, and there's no, no time to focus on you, yourself, your relationships. If you do feel that way, or if you have felt that way, welcome to the American experience. In researching this message, I read a whole bunch of mental health articles. And because uh, I was interested in this subject, I'm like, let's see what's, what's out there. I read eight or ten of them, and I found one that said 79% of U.S. adults will experience burnout in uh, their working and child-raising years. I thought, 79%? That's a huge number. Eight out of ten? Really? And then I thought, you know what, that is a big number, but I can't really argue with it. I myself has, have experienced burnout. I know what that is. I know what it feels like. And, you know, when we do experience burnout, when we burn up, when we flame out, we tend to experience emotional extremes, one or the other. We go one way or the other. We might go totally numb, or we might become hypersensitive, and both are unhealthy. We might become cynical, spiteful, angry, or hopeless. On the flip side of that, we might go into, I'm going to party till I die mode, because I've got nothing to lose, right? And both of those are unhealthy places to be. Burnout can cause loss of sleep. Or it might cause a feeling that you just want to hibernate. Uh, just going to 
cover myself with a blanket and wait for a new season, right? Both are unhealthy. Here's point number one for you today, guys. Adults expect that the world around us will take more than its share. Today's all about expectations. Today we're talking about how adults, people who lean into wisdom, will manage their expectations. Look, there's many people who recognize this fact, okay, that adults expect that the world around us is going to take more than its share. There's lots of people who recognize it. One way that some people try to deal with it is they say, well, I'm just going to radiate positive energy and excellence out into the universe, and it's going to bounce around, and it's just going to return to me with all kinds of positivity and unicorn glitter and puppy dog breath or whatever, right? And, uh, you know... <laughs> This is just a place that the theory or the theology, not the theory, but the theology of positive mental projection, of positive mental uh, thinking has taken a step too far. And in many people's lives, it's become uh, a replacement for Jesus. Most people who dive deep into the positive mental projection or positive mental thinking world, they last two or three years in there. And then they come to the reality like I did when I uh, try to uh, run through that about 20 years ago, that y you're right, the world will feed you. But it will most likely feed you a punch in the nose, more often than not. Look, I'm not saying that having a positive mental attitude is a bad thing. I am saying that when it becomes a replacement for Jesus, that's idolatry and it is a bad thing. Okay? So if you're, you're big on, you know what, I'm going to have positivity today, that's great. Be positive. Jesus is your Savior. Not, not you, not your mind, not your ability to project positivity into a universe, okay? Now look, our Creator knows full well that the world around us has its hand out in our lives. Our Creator knows that the world is always going to demand more from us. More, please. Next sacrifice, please. Give up a little more, a little more time, a little more energy, a little more thoughts. Come on, more, 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 more. He knows that the world's always going to take more than its share of time, more than its share of mental energy, more than its share of physical energy, more than its share of emotional energy from us. And He knows that it will always under-deliver on our investment. It will. Two weeks ago, we read Jesus uh, teaching us that we are to love God and love others. We were talking about engaging with emotions, remember, and the adults manage their emotions. And we read that Jesus teaching us we are supposed to love God and we are supposed to love others. That's the do's about love. And today, we're going to check out uh, John, who is going to teach us about the do-nots concerning love. We're in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. This is what we read. It says, do not love this world, nor the things that it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. And these are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world, key point, and this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. I love that statement at, at the end, but anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. But I want you to understand that's not, a, that's not a religious statement. See, because Jesus said that the work that God requires, the work that God requires of us is to believe in the one whom he has sent. So it's not a religious statement saying that we need to check a bunch of boxes. Instead, it is a faith statement saying that we need to trust Jesus, not ourselves. Trust Jesus, not the world. Jesus taught, taught us this as well. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21, he says, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal, but store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Okay, so we need to expect the unexpected, right? And we need to know where to put our energies in life. And Jesus clearly teaches us we need to put our energies and our, our efforts in long-term things, heavenly things, not short-term earthly things. Okay? Got it. But that information is not immediately impactful for me for the, for the first problem that we identified. The problem that I'm running like this all the time, full blast. I need to get off the gas pedal. And you might too, right? Like I said at the beginning, most of us are running at or near 100% all the time. And we feel like we're going to blow a gasket. feel like we're going to explode all over the people in our lives. And, and here's the thing, my friends. God doesn't want us to live in that place. Here's a beautiful promise for all of us from Psalm 23. In fact, it's more than a promise. 
This is actually a defining characteristic about the nature of God. This is who he is and what he does. Read with me. Psalm 23, 1 through 3 says, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Look, a measuring stick, a warning light on the dash panel of our lives is exhaustion. God doesn't intend for us to live in those zones. He has no intention to have us rev out, burn out, blow a seal. The psalm makes it crystal clear. He lets us rest. He leads us to peaceful places, and he renews our strength. Now, how does he do that? What's the godly method that we're supposed to be engaging in to experience that as a reality in our lives? The answer is the fourth commandment. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Now, don't, I don't want to lose anybody yet. Keep the Sabbath day holy. I know some of us may have a, a, a weird experience with this, and we're going we're gonna to break into it. But let's read it first. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11. We, uh, well, we read, remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. I'm actually going to stop there for just a second. Just side note, something for you to remember. The word holy means set apart. It means taken out of a group and set aside. It's pulled away from a mass and set aside for a specific reason. That's what holiness is, holy. So if you have 10 cookies and you take one cookie and put it over here, that's a holy cookie. Okay? So just keep that in mind and, and use that. It's important as you read your Bible. But remember to observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Set it aside. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Now, there's many of us who have a negative association with the word Sabbath, right? As a kid, I thought that uh, a grumpy old God just commanded this day of no fun for no reason, except maybe he was a jerk. To me, Sabbath meant no TV, no friends, no riding my bike, no laughter, no no rock and roll music. I, I hated it, right? And I'm not a pastor who nerds out or geeks out on the Greek and Hebrew words because here at Lakeview Church, we believe that we have a powerful, mighty, intentional creator who is able to communicate with us and we are able to understand him in our own language. I don't believe that we need to be able to speak a foreign language to be able to know God. But uh, that said, the word Sabbath is an interesting word that's worth taking a little closer look at. Sabbath is an English word, but it's just an incarnation of a Hebrew word. It comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat. And the word Shabbat means to stop, to withdraw, to rest, to recuperate, or to renew. Those don't sound like bad things, right? Here's point number two for you. Adults know that the Sabbath is a gift. It's a strength. It's not a religious swear word. Different religions argue about the specifics, right? Some say, hey, we need to observe the Sabbath on Saturday. Some say we need to observe the Sabbath on Sunday. Some say Wednesday. At Lakeview Church, we teach this. The Sabbath day is a day off. It's a day to take a break from your work. In my old job, I was an airline captain. Many of you may not know this, but the federal government of the United States of America demands by law that all airline crew members observe the Sabbath. Did you know that? They they don't call it that, of course, but there's a, a law about rest rules for crew members that says from any point in time, you have to be able to look seven days backwards at what you did seven days forward at what you're scheduled to do, and then apply a seven-day sliding scale to all of that, and there can never be more than six work days in that scale. That's the Sabbath. It says you must take one of seven off at a minimum. That's the law. In this job, now I'm a pastor. My work's different than it used to be. Now my work is study, message preparation, phone calls, meeting with people, counseling, uh, team building, training, planning, right? Friday's my Sabbath. Why Friday? Well, it just happens to work for my schedule. Saturday's busy. Sunday's definitely a work day. On Friday, I take a day off. What it means is it doesn't mean that I sit around and, and, and don't do anything or, or be unproductive. It means that I take a rest from this work. So on my day off, you might find me doing gardening. You might find me moving material on my tractor. You might find me working on the car. That's a Sabbath. I'm not doing pastor stuff on Fridays. Look, there's a biblical principle here, by the way. 
It's a sermon for a different day, but something to keep in mind. All of God's commands, all of them, every single thing that God asks of us is actually for us. He's for us. And everything he asks of us is actually for us. Look, let's dig into this just a little deeper. The Sabbath day is one of seven. If you do that math, one divided by seven, you get 14.28%, just in case you're a numbers guy. Some of you are going, where are you going with this, Jeff? 14.28%. Let's call it 15. Here's a biblical principle for you. Here's some wisdom. God does not want us running at 100% near the red line all the time. He wants us to have some margin in our life, like a shock absorber. There's got to be a little room on the shock absorber. There's always got to be a little gas in the tank. Otherwise, the waves of life, if they just compress our shock absorber of life, sooner or later, it's going to bottom out. What happens? We break. God doesn't want us in that place. What, what this means is that every time we hit 85% on our personal explodometer, it's time for a break. It's time to stop and take a Sabbath. Now, I understand that this is countercultural, right? But remember in the first two weeks, I told you that sometimes if we're going to lean into wisdom, it means that we're going to have collision points. We're going to have collision points between wisdom and popular or wisdom and standard operating procedure. We're going to have collision points between wisdom and what the world says, and this is one of those times. Don't run 99.9. Take a break. You know what? There's another point there, too, that God didn't just ask. He didn't say, hey, you can take a break if you want. He said it as a command. He said, I love you. I care about you. I don't want you blown out. Take a rest. Rest. It's a command. All right, let's move along from it. Point number three, adults expect life to be hard. It's going to be tough, maybe even frightful, but they pre-decide how they will behave when it gets that way. Look, my friends, life on earth is scary. It's full of dangers. Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter who you are or what you are. If you are a living organism on this planet, then you are in constant danger of death. This is universally true for all creatures, okay? And it has been ever since Adam and Eve stepped out of the Garden of Eden. Let's get this straight. We, in these meat suits that we wear, are very frail organisms, and we live on a speck of dust that we call planet Earth, and we are hurtling through outer space at tens of thousands of miles per hour with millions of unknown dangers and tens of thousands of known dangers flying at us all the time. To make matters much worse, we're in close orbit around a giant nuclear explosion that is constantly bombarding us with deadly radiation, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, always. There's nothing about this experience that is safe. It's not safe. It never has been safe. And it's never going to be safe as long as we live on this rock, on this mud ball. Look, like I said, all life, all life on Earth is having a scary experience. Imagine for a minute that you are a happy little bacteria and you're living in a microscopic crack in a kitchen counter and you're just there one hour raising your millions and millions of beautiful little bacteria babies and life's good in your little microscopic spot. And here comes a Clorox wipe and it eliminates your entire continent. It's really sad. I mean, life's tough for a bacteria, right? What if you're a worm? I'm just a happy little earthworm. Good morning. I got a full belly. I'm just eating the flower roots off of this guy, out of this guy's garden, and I'm just chilling in the soil. <laughs> bird picks you up. You're flying through the air. Next thing you know, you're down the gullet of a squabbling baby bird. Life's tough for a worm. It is. What about the bird? Bird goes around. I'm a bird. So much better than everyone else. I'm above them. I'm up here. It's danger free. Ha. Pretty soon, the bird has to sit down on a branch, tucks his little birdie head under his wing, and then my cat jumps down and eats it or kills it. And I know this because uh, my cat kills four to five birds per week. I know this number because she graciously displays them for me on the workbench of my, in my garage in something that looks like the leftovers of a horrible satanic ritual. It's head, feet, wing, wing, poof, bird stuff. It's tough being a bird. All creatures live under constant threats, all of us. That's what life is. It is a constant and continuous threat of death. That is the experience that we're in. So what do we do about it? 
All the other creatures seem to go about their business. They accept the threat, and they live. And sometimes we don't. What's the difference? The difference is a tool that our enemy uses against us. And that tool that he uses against us is fear. Fear is a big problem. It's a big problem in our lives. Because of fear, uh, we're separated. Fear separates us. Fear breeds mistrust between us. Fear causes us to judge one another, not love one another. Jesus commanded one of those. Fear causes us to judge one another. Fear causes us to trust the world instead of trust God, just like Peter. A couple weeks ago, we talked about Peter when he was walking on the water, when his focus was on Jesus entirely. What was he doing? He was walking above it. He was walking above the danger. He was walking through it. Was it present? Yes. But he was above it. He was out of it. And the moment he looked down and allowed fear to touch him, he was in it. It's fear that we are constantly and clearly and repeatedly commanded not to have. It is fear that we are constantly told by God, do not participate in this. My daughter, um, when she was young, she had a terrible, debilitating fear of thunder. There was nothing we could do about it. Heather and I tried everything to calm her. But the sound of thunder would set her off uh, like nothing we could imagine. And there was just nothing we could do to calm her down. Now, this is at a time that we had, my job had moved us to uh, South Texas. We lived in Houston. And if anybody knows anything about Houston, you know that there are thunderstorms every single day, just about, right? Oklahoma, thunderstorms every day. It's just part of life, right? So my parents were visiting from, from Salt Lake City, and they were with us in Houston. It's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We're in the kitchen. We're preparing a meal. Boom, thunder. There goes my daughter. She's about seven or eight years old, nine years old at the time. And she hits the wall of the kitchen, and she huddles down. And, I mean, just as she did, inconsolable, almost like having a seizure fear. And my dad was standing there. And he looked at me, and he looked at her, and he looked at me, and he looked at her. And he said, I, I don't know. We've tried everything. I just don't know what to do. So my dad went over there, and he, he leaned up against the wall, and then he crouched down next to her. And he said, girl, why are you afraid? And she said, the thunder, I don't like the sound. What didn't you like about it? That it's, it's scary. It scares me. He said, I understand that. And then he said something interesting to her. He said, well, at least it's not bombs. Now, that seems like a really dumb thing to say, right? At least it's not bombs. Of course it's not bombs. It's thunder. It seems like a dumb thing to say until you realize a couple of things. My dad was born in January of 1936 in Berlin. He was seven years old when the Allies started daily bombing runs on his hometown. He was nine years old in 1945 when the war ended, so he spent two years running in and out of a potato cellar listening to thunder, the sound of bombs eliminating his town. So he told her this story, and you know what? She changed her expectation. She suddenly had perspective. She stopped fearing. He said to her, he said, child, stop your fear. Stop it. God was always with me, and he will always be with you. Stop being afraid. And she did. She suddenly had perspective. She changed her expectation. She had a wider view. She got it all of a sudden, and she's never been afraid of thunder since. And you know what? I want to give us some perspective today. No matter what's going on around us, no matter what the world has to offer us, God says this, Isaiah 41, 13. He says, for I hold you by the right hand. I, the Lord your God, period. Notice how he makes sure that we know who's talking here. I hold you by the right hand, I, the Lord, your God. And I say to you, don't be afraid. I am here to help you. We get more. Psalm 91, 1 through 6 says, Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust Him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Psalm makes it clear, guys. There have always been scary things. And there's always going to be scary things 
And yet, there is nothing to fear. Does this mean that the Christian life is going to be easy? Or there's going to be a walk in the park? No, (laughs) not at all. Not even remotely. I love what C.S. Lewis said about the experience of the Christian life. He says, we were promised sufferings. They were always part of the program. We were even told, blessed are those that mourn. And I accept it. I've got nothing here that I hadn't bargained for. C.S. Lewis. Look, in this season, I've had lots of people say to me, Pastor Jeff, I'm afraid. And I, my heart breaks for them. It really does. But I, when I'm told this, I ask a, a, a simple question. I said, are you afraid because of something that you read in your Bible? Or, or phrase it a different way. Are you afraid because of something Jesus taught you? And without a doubt, so far, that answer has been, well, no. And so I ask a different question, a follow-up question. I said, well, are you afraid, excuse me, at the time that you got this scary information, the time you got this scary information, the thing that you were looking at or the thing that you were listening to when this scary information came to you, does it have a power button? Uh, yeah. Turn it off. Turn it off. Now, look, I'm not saying be ignorant. I'm not saying cover your eyes and cover your ears. I'm saying exactly the opposite of that. I'm saying take a break. Take a Sabbath. Take a moment and turn off the noise and recalibrate, refocus, renew your strength. The the psalm said that God's promises are our shield and our strength. Turn off the noise and find yourself behind a shield and strength of God's promises. Take a break. Open your eyes, not close them. Open your eyes to the truth. And here's the truth. 2 Timothy 1.7 says this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. How many of us can honestly look ourselves in the eyes and say, yes, the last six months I have been operating and moving and breathing in a spirit of power? Not very many of us. And of love, love's an action word. That's something we go out and do. Jesus said, love God with all your heart, mind, mind and strength, and then love one another. That's an action thing. We go do it. How many of us are doing it? Not many right now. And of sound mind. Sound mind means stable, steady, immovable. Not blown about by every wind. Meep, meep, meep. What's that? It must be a missing child. It's the amber. Oh, no. Governor's going to talk day after tomorrow. I'm glad that I got the surprise heart attack for that. An email would have been fine. Look, if we're living in a spirit of fear this season, it means that we are trusting the TV or the smartphone instead of Jesus. It's very simple. It's hard to admit, but that's what it means. It's time to hit the reset button. Sometimes. Sometimes we have to turn it off, refocus, renew. I'm telling you to don't give anyone or anything the power to make you fearful, but take the power back. Hit the power button. It's push and hold, by the way. You'll know it, you did it correctly when the screen goes blank. Um, about 72 hours after you do this, if you want to go that long, all of a sudden or sometime after you do this, all of a sudden you're going to have this realization. You're going to go, man, I have no idea what travesties or terrors are happening right now. Huh, you know what? I don't know if there's civil unrest over here. I don't know if there's riots over there. I don't know how many people got corona today, but you know what I do know? I do know that card game I just played with my kids was amazing. It was fun. You know what I do know? I do know that movie I just watched with my wife was relaxing. You know what I know? I know that hug and that laughter that I shared with my friend renewed me. It felt good. In fact, it felt an awful lot like what God promised that he would renew my strength, that he would take me to calm places. My friends, we must pre-decide to stand fearless in this world. Fearless, without fear, we are commanded over and over and over and over and over again. Do not fear. We must pre-decide. I will stand fearless in this world, and when the world gets too loud or too much, I'm just going to turn it off. Today's message is all about expectations. And if there's one thing that every single one of us has learned this year, it's that the world will absolutely fail to meet our expectations. Let me put that another way. We must stop placing our faith 
in the things of the world, in the power of the world, in the wisdom of the world. We have to stop that. I don't think there's a single one of us that can't relate to that this year. 2020 proved that our expectations cannot be met and will not be met by this world. There are a lot of us that had some expectations this year, right? And this year, the world exposed itself for what it is. It's a liar, it's a mirage, it's dust, it's empty, it's powerless, it's inanimate, and it is not worthy of our faith. The world is not worthy of our trust, but Jesus is. And only Jesus is, and that's the bottom line for you today. Adults realize that only Jesus can meet our expectations. I'm going to ask the band to come up here with me. I know I'm a few minutes long here, but I'm going to try to wrap this up in a hurry. Look, the world exposed itself. It showed its true colors this year for every one of us. Every single one of us started this year with some expectations. Some of us might have expected, you know what, I have a great job. I have seniority. I'm going to be okay through whatever economic shenanigans come my way. And what happened? Well, welcome to the unemployment line. Some of us expected, ah, it's good. This is just a blip on the radar. I'm going on vacation. No, you're not. Some of us expected, oh, I'm good. I have season passes to a dozen different places. Something will be open. And what happened? Nope. Everything's closed. You have season passes to nowhere. Some of us thought, well, if all else fails, I can always get together with my friends and family. Nope. They're afraid of you now. And some of us thought, you know what? Well, if all else fails, I can go to the park with my kids. No, that's closed too. And some of us thought homeschoolers are weird. Welcome to homeschooling. I'm sure you're going to do great. And you know what? You might want to reach out to some of your weird homeschooling friends because they actually know how to do this and they're really, really good at it. And some of us thought there'd be plenty of toilet paper. How did that work out? Look, the world fails to meet our expectations, even our very basic ones. The list goes on and on and on and on and on. The world has let us down in every single area of our lives. Not one of us have an excuse for trusting the things of the world anymore. And through all this, through all this stuff that should be simple, there's one thing that hasn't changed. One person who hasn't changed. And his name is Jesus. He stands set apart. He stands holy, unmoved, unchanged, unaffected, steady, true, as always. He is still the way. He is still the truth. He is still the life, Jesus. He's still the author and perfecter of our faith. Anybody starting to get some courage? You starting to feel like you have a little power in you now? Let's remind ourselves of these promises. He's still the creator and the savior of the world. He's still the one who comforts us and protects us and shelters us. Jesus is his name. He's still our shield. He's still our high tower. His word is still true, and it is still a lamp to our feet so that we do not go stumbling around in the darkness. And today is still the day of salvation. And Jesus is still right in front of us with his arms wide open saying, bring the little children to me. That's us. We get to go be comfort. We get to drop our fear and go be embraced by him. That's Jesus. Look, I said at the beginning of this series that we were going to examine things that we had been believing in our life and we we're going to throw out whatever stinks. My friends, if you've been believing that the world is going to save you or that the world's wisdom is going to come through for you, if you've been trusting the bad news of the news cycle instead of the good news of Jesus Christ, or if you've been trusting in your own righteousness instead of his, then I am inviting you today to change your mind and trust Jesus instead. Change your mind. By the way, that means repent. Repentance means change your mind. I'm inviting you to repent and change your mind and trust Jesus instead of the world. If you don't know how that looks, I invite you to come up here today, grab me, grab Heather, grab anyone, grab anyone, grab a member of our prayer team. We'll be happy to go with you to the Lord and say, you know what, Lord, let's, let's ask for power. Let's ask for freedom. Let's ask for peace. Let's ask for rest. And let's expect to receive it because he, Jesus, is still the king and he is still the immovable rock of our salvation. Let's operate in power and peace in him. Amen? All right. Lord God, thank you so much that you are sovereign, that you are powerful, that you are immovable. Lord, I come before you today, and I admit personally, Lord, I have trusted where I should not have trusted. I've trusted the world at times that I shouldn't have. I should have trusted you, Lord. I repent. Lord, I trust you and you alone for safety. I trust you and you alone for peace. I trust you and you alone for salvation, for my joy, for my freedom, and I trust you you for rest. Lord, I ask you to walk with every one of us this week, that we can walk in those things in a spirit of power 
and of love and of sound mind. In your son's name, amen. Have a great week. Amen. We have.